Welcome to part 3 of Lecture 17 of Aerospace Propulsion. So we left off with this question of why does increasing the incidence raise the pressure ratio? Here's the, a visual depiction of the, reasons, of the reason. There's a couple ways of explaining this. You could say that it increases the force on the blades. It increases the change in absolute tangential velocity across the rotor, which is probably the easiest way to think about it. Um, and there's also more increase in stream tube area, so more diffusion and thus a higher static pressure rise. But the second one is maybe the easiest one to understand, that it's the inc it increases the uh, change in absolute tangential velocity across the rotor. So in these plots, I've sort of shown a uh, generic fan or compressor rotor um, blade section. And in black, we have velocity triangles upstream and downstream of the rotor at the design incidence. And in red, we have velocity triangles for a reduced mass flow at the same rotational speed. All right, we see the rotational speeds are the same because the U, the sort of bottom leg of this triangle, is the same length in both cases. So at design, right, there's essentially very small or maybe zero incidence and the relative flow angle is kind of matched to the direction of the flow at the blade leading edges with the absolute inflow being axial. Um, and when we reduce the mass flow, we see that we increase incidence um, to a positive incidence because the absolute flow angle or absolute axial velocity is decreased, but the blade speeds change, so it's a sort of sharp, steeper triangle. What that means, if we make the assumption that the axial velocity is constant through the blade row, is that we, we leave at the same relative flow angle if we neglect any variations in deviation, but we, we sort of stop this, this vector sooner, right? Because the axial velocity is less. And then we still have to go over to the left by u um, to, to get to the absolute velocity. And so we can see, comparing this point to this point, that we achieve a higher absolute tangential velocity when we operate at positive incidence, um, which happens because of the reduced mass flow. We can also look at the behavior at constant incidence or constant flow coefficient. Um, in this case, the mass flow is approximately proportional to the rotational speed, right, if the flow coefficient is roughly constant. And the pressure rise is approximately proportional to the rotational speed squared. So we get something that basically looks like a parabola, which is what I've sort of sketched in red here. And we see it's very similar to, but not identical to, the locus of maximum efficiency points along uh, the, the characteristic. Now looking at the curves or the lines of constant speed, we see that the shape of these varies dramatically with rotational speed. At low speed, we get these very gradually curving lines, um, and over large regions, they're, they're pretty linear, right? They're, they're sort of this negatively sloped, uh, almost a straight line. But at high speed, the lines start to become uh, so sort of turn over more sharply and become nearly vertical and then become essentially completely vertical at the very highest speeds. Um, and we start to see that happening at sort of the highest uh, mass flows or the lowest pressure ratios as we sort of move uh, up in speed here. And what's happening here is the rotor blades are choking. So we're basically um, hitting the point where we cannot stick more mass flow so you know, the, the pressure ratio sort of can, can vary, but the mass flow cannot change. Right, the choking mass flow, and the reason these aren't all on top of each other is, uh, is that the choking mass flow increases with rotational speed because it depends on the relative stagnation pressures, which go up as the blades spin faster. Now in practice, what we call an operating or a working line is the locus of reachable points on that fan map. If we place a nozzle or a fixed throttle downstream of a fan or a compressor, essentially we restrict the operating conditions to a single curve called the operating or the working line. And this is uh, similar to uh, what, what we see in, 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 the, in the lab uh, data that was posted when we were in um, sort of at constant throttle position and just vary the rotational speed. Um, this operating or working line is roughly parallel to the, to the surge line with the limit of stability of the machine. 
um, and we tend to move away from the maximum efficiency locus as the speed is reduced. If the nozzle is choked downstream, then the working line corresponds to constant non-dimensional mass flow at the fan exit. Now if we move on to uh, the core compressors, these are multi-stage machines, which is the big thing that differentiates them from fans. This multi-stage nature yields some important differences in performance compared to the single-stage fan that we were just looking at. Um, first of all, if you need a pressure ratio higher than about 7, it's pretty much impossible to achieve that with fixed geometry blades and typically variable stators, which means that you can sort of rotate the stators about their um, stacking axis to change their the, the inlet and outlet row to flow or absolute flow angles. Um, that, that, that's needed, at least for some stages, to get really high pressure ratios. So here we see a, a relatively low uh, pressure ratio multi-stage compressor um, with you know, the maximum pressure ratio of about 5. Um, and it has the same generic characteristic, but we see, um, first of all, the big thing to notice, if I go back a moment, is here, okay, we went down to 65% speed and we still had a sort of a lot of operating range. Um, here, when you see at a similar speed, there's very little operating range left between the sort of choke point and the stall point that, you know, in terms of the variation of mass flow. So the operating range of multi-stage compressors tends to be much smaller than the operating range of single-stage fans. We also don't see that steep um, vertical lines on the characteristic indicating choking in the passages. Um, for sort of practical operating conditions. But otherwise, qualitatively, it looks pretty similar. So if we have those variable stators, we can get to very high pressure ratios. Um, these are typically located in the first several stages. And basically, they turn the flow entering the rotors to be more tangential when the rotational speed is decreased. And this improves sort of incidence matching or decreases the incidence onto the rotors and helps prevent flow separation and, and rotating stall or surge. So here's a, a pressure, uh, a compressor with a, here's the design point, which looks like it's, it's maybe around a pressure ratio of about 23. Um, and again, we have sort of efficiency at the top here. We actually have the efficiency data. Um, and what we see is that we've got sort of the design point, the measured working line uh, in the engine is actually not quite on that design point. That often will happen, um, but it's close, not bad. Um, and you, again, you see that how it's pretty parallel to the stall line, but the difference between the stall line, or the distance, I should say, between the stall line and the operating line uh, get what gets less and less and less. And when they meet, that sort of defines the, the limit of the lowest operating speeds you can use with the compressor. So we can see here, tests have been done down at sort of 50% rotational speed, but it looks like you know si something just below 60% would actually, with whatever sort of is downstream locking you onto this working line, would be the lowest you'd be able to achieve. And the efficiencies here also have a much larger range of variation. At the low speeds, the efficiency is very low, um, down in the 50 to 60 to 70 percent range, whereas it's in the sort of upper 80s near the design point. The differences here also you see is so the um, the dots or the circles are rig tests where the compressor is operated on its own, um, and that's how you can obtain all these separate speed lines. And then the uh, crosses and pluses I don't know what the difference between the crosses and pluses is um, are tests on the engine, um, and so there you see that essentially that we're, we're restricted to the working line. And that's how that that working line was obtained. So in terms of what's different when we measure in the rig versus on the engine, right? So on the engine, the geometry is fixed, so changing speed just yields the working line. But in a rig, we can independently vary the throttle area as well as the speed, so we can get these lines of constant speed um, and at, at different uh, rotational speeds. So we essentially can independently control the speed and the flow rate. The next important concept that I want to introduce is that of polytropic efficiency. 
This is a way of leveling the playing field when we're talking about compressors or fans of, of different pressure ratios. So far we've described all our component efficiencies using, using isentropic efficiency, but for multi-stage machines, it's useful to think in terms of this of polytropic efficiency. Um, and this is the efficiency associated with a small amount of the compression process. The biggest reason to do this is it makes the math a lot easier. Importantly, it also removes a bias in the treatment of compressors versus turbines and of machines of different pressure ratios, which we'll illustrate in a minute. First, I'm going to give the basic definition of a polytropic efficiency. It's a simple factor on the exponent of what would otherwise be the isentropic relationship between a temperature and pressure ratio. So for a compressor, it goes in the denominator, and for a turbine, it goes in the numerator um, if we're getting a temperature ratio from a pressure ratio. So in other words, if this thing is less than one, uh, it's going to make this a larger exponent, which means you get more temperature rise than you would in the isentropic case for a given pressure ratio. And for a turbine, if it's this thing's less than one, you get less uh, work extraction for a given pressure ratio than you would have if it was a isentropic machine. Now the polytropic and isentropic efficiencies can be related analytically, um, and that's done here in general. So we see uh, pressure ratio, and this is defined essentially um, uh, separately for turbines and compressors. So uh, you know, a pressure ratio for, of five for a turbine is sort of really a pressure ratio of 0 0.2, right? Uh, one over five. But uh, th this is the way we can plot it all in one graph. So on the left side of the, of the plot is turbines, on the right side of the plot is compressors, and on the vertical axis is the isentropic efficiency that we've been using up to now. And the curves of con constant polytropic efficiency are shown uh, on the plot. And what we see is that they, they are equal whenever the pressure ratio is one, but that's not very interesting because that means it's a machine that did nothing. And we also see is that it's always the case that in compressors, the isentropic efficiency is lower than the polytropic efficiency, right? So if I consider sort of this point here, it's a 95% polytropic efficiency, but it's maybe 94, 93% uh, isentropic efficiency and for turbines it's the opposite if I consider maybe this point here um, it's 85 percent polytropic efficiency but it's about 87 percent isentropic efficiency so let's think a little bit more about the reason for this difference so consider both a two-stage compressor where each stage has the same uh, pressure ratio and a single stage compressor that has the same overall pressure ratio as the two stages combined. If each stage has, say, a 90% isentropic efficiency, which compressor is overall more efficient and why? Think about this for a couple of minutes and then try to come up with an answer for yourself before you move on to the next part of the video. And we'll also take this question up during the tutorial.